Hello, dreamers. Welcome back to the show. If this is your first time watching or listening, welcome. Thanks for stopping by. Hit subscribe on the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at livingthedream506. Share it. Tell your friends about it. All that good stuff. Everything helps. So thanks, at the very least, for just being here. My guest today is probably best known as the drummer for the band The National, as well as multiple other projects like Lanzendorf, Royal Green, and Farmers. I love his style and taste in music, and on Instagram, his name is Postmodern Drummer. I love his genre, I love his music, and I love talking to him. I hope you enjoy our chat. Let's get into it. Hey, everybody. I'm Brian Devendorf of The National, and I am living the dream. Brian Devendorf, how are you, sir? I am well. How are you, man? I'm good, man. I'm really excited to be talking to you right now. Cool. Lots of new music happening. Uh, Lanzendorf, Royal Green, anything else on in the works right now? Uh, I recently played, well, actually, actually, I guess that would have been last November. I played drums for a couple guys that uh, record under the name Beta Radio. Um. So I don't know when that's coming out at some point. Nice. <laughs> that was just pure drumming. They're really fun, really cool guys from North Carolina. Uh, and then I'm, and I have with my collaborator on the uh, Royal Green Project, Nate Martinez and I are kind of slow cooking some instrumental kind of brainwave uh, <laughs> music. Um, yeah, and then Under- just general just little things, you know. So it, you've been keeping busy, obviously. Mostly with staying alive and taking care of the family. But yeah, tr- I mean, right. not, I'm, yeah, I'm trying to, I'm mostly doing a lot of practice pad work. <laughs> like Explain. drum pad. Well, like uh, just working on my, uh, my hands for drumming, you know, just learning more esoteric uh, note subdivisions and just oddball snare drum etude kind of stuff. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what's that? Is that for everything? That's just for practice working out basically? Just for practice, but I have a view to arrange these crazy patterns into like a, you know, percussion solo, you know, like multi-tracked, right. just kind of like so percussion style, kind of like a dumbed down version of so percussion. <laughs> I, <guess. laughs> I don't know. So you just put out a a record with Lanzendorf, right? And Royal Green. Yeah, the Lanzendorf EP came out on the 4th, and Royal Green was out the week before that. Um, Lanzendorf does have more material to come. This was an instrumental EP that was uh, distilled, I guess, from several days improv jamming in a studio uh, with the guys. Um, and so from that material, we had enough for basically a quadruple album. (laughs) So we split it up for now into an EP and then a forthcoming LP, which was, I think, coming at the end of October. Um, Still coming then? I'm pretty sure. The the vinyl may not be available, but the, but the, the stream will, for sure. Yeah. We're hoping to have the vinyl on that date, but we'll see. Yeah. And Lanzendorf, that's you and your brother and uh, Ben Lanz, right. who has also multi-instrumentalist pedigree in many projects. And Aaron Arntz com- completes the, the, the quartet. Um, Aaron knows Ben through the band Beirut. Like he was in the oh, live yeah. Beirut band with Ben. Aaron also plays with Grizzly Bear um, and his other various things. He's like a 
a keyboard p- piano prodigy with a background in like doctorate level AI research. <laughs> so he has some really strong, um, he's a strong player and also a very smart like engineer when it comes to assembling his rig, you know? <laughs> right. Nice. Yeah, I love, I love Grizzly Bear. Okay. Yeah, he's the guy with, who's in the dark <laughs> on the <laughs> nice. ride playing keyboards. Yeah. <laughs> now, what's it like playing music with your brother? A lot of people are wondering what the dynamics like with like family and music put together. Oh, uh, well, it's all we've known. I sh- Scott recently uncovered our very first uh, jam session recording we did. Probably like, I don't know, must have been, it was probably, it was when I got my drum set on Christmas of probably like, I don't even know, 1986 or seven, 88. Um, it's basically me trying to boss him around with no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> it's like totally out of time. And he's got, he has a, he had like, I think he had like a boss delay pedal. It was very much the era of, you know, U2, Joshua Tree, Rattle and Hum. So we all wanted to be The Edge and Bono and Larry Mullen Jr. and all that, Adam Clayton. Uh, so we just did that for a while. We played violin together before that. We were in the trenches, you know, going to Suzuki and sort of the, the rigorous instruction was, uh, it was a formative experience that we <laughs> made us hate violin, but it brought us closer together as siblings. And then, uh, yeah, and then he went to college. I went to college. And then we kind of just, we had a band in high school together too, <laughs> like a trio kind of playing kind of like, po- I guess it'd be post-punk. I don't know. Nice. Um, and, then, and then in college, he and Matt met at, at school in Cincinnati and they formed a band and then everyone there's kind of this like New York city at the time had still does. I'm sure has this natural pull. So everyone moves to New York from Ohio who has any interest in doing anything in the creative fields. So they went, they they moved there for design and moved there for book publishing. And we formed a band like a few years later around 90, I think it was 99, the summer of 99. Um, so so, so I guess, really I guess been, sorry. So there's never really been any like family disputes or things like that. Oh like, no, there's disputes all along the way, but I guess it's just been like a constant progression, and we've always been together. So, and I'm sure it's the same for Aaron and Bryce, even more so than sharing a room and also DNA, you know, right. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> um, but oh yeah, I mean, there's always disputes, and I think it's easier to get over the disputes because you still have to, you know, exist in the same family, <laughs> you know. Um, and and he's, he's a good big brother. He, he's, he's definitely like the, the, you know, the cool big brother who introduced me to like good music and all that kind of stuff, you know. So with The National, there's two sets of brothers and a lot of people are also wondering about that dynamic, like two sets of brothers plus one, for a uh-huh. band dynamic, is that has that had any weirdness uh, to it? I mean, I, I don't know because it's it, it doesn't seem it's just normal to me. Whatever happens, <laughs> I don't think it's weird. I, it it does create the potential for you know camps. Exactly. If you do the math, there's like two is even, one's odd. But no, I mean, uh, really. It's it's more the things we really get heated about are like creative issues or, you know, but no, we we've we're, we've kind of mellowed with age, let's say, right. <laughs> as well. So democracy still works in the band. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> so like with so many projects on the go, do you tip like typically keep them all active in your life, or do you try to focus on one band at a time? Uh it is a juggling act. I'm not good at it. Like I owe. <laughs> a couple drum tracks to people that I <laughs> haven't delivered. Um, so yeah, I'm really bad at multitasking and I'm very focused. I'm more oriented on focusing at one thing at a time, but yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've always been one to turn things in late and kind of like run behind, but eventually it gets done. So, right. Yeah. So like, do you notice any differences in your drumming styles when you're playing with the different projects? Like, do you purposely get into a different mindset and try to comp- compartmentalize 
styles and sounds for each? Oh, yeah. But when I do play with other people, they want to be to, like, do what you do sometimes, you know. <laughs> but usually I'll, I'll try to do exactly what they want. Sometimes they'll have, like, a, uh, like a MIDI part for holding uh, position and I'll just kind of play that as closely as I can. Right. Um, yeah. And I always like to get tips from non drummers. They're always able to, you know, get outside of the typical cliches or behaviors, you know, of drum stuff, you know? Um, but yeah, I mean, I try to just like do whatever they want, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of the point of getting you right. Like is, pick you up for what you know what you're doing and the style that you have. Yeah. Yeah. Like earlier today, I was talking to my friend Ray Gracewood. He, uh, he puts on the area 506 festival in New Brunswick, Canada. Uh -huh. And he had a good question. He said, I've always thought his drumming was brilliantly minimalist. I always thought the use of toms is an underappreciated element of their overall sound. And I've always wondered what are his influences and inspiration to focus so heavy on bass tom versus hi-hat and snare? Huh, that's an excellent question um, for your friend there. Uh, how to unpack that one? I guess, I mean, just sonically, I, I never really, I mean, the hi-hat can be just too much. And nowadays, it's, you don't even miss it, you know? <laughs> But yeah, I feel like early on, my first drum teacher was in a band called the Afghan Wigs that were had a, you know, they did a big thing happening, at least for Cincinnati, you know, in the 90s. So his name was Steve Earle. So I'd go see him play. And that was kind of his bread and butter. Like in the verses, play the toms and in the chorus, hit the cymbals. And, or that's, I mean, that's that whole era, like Smashing Pumpkins, you know, but if it goes back farther uh, to, you know, like New Order, that kind of stuff. Um, but also I think just my own hearing, when I mean, you're sitting there playing drums, like cymbals can be quite annoying, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and just like, it's just that kind of power thud can be appealing. Um, but I also think the music we make kind of lends itself to that, you know, just this kind of dark, murky, picture in the background um and a lot of it's not my doing you know a, another band member like an aaron or a scott or somebody would be like hey try doing on the tom you know <laughs> like sure <laughs> um a lot of it's just trial and error you know whatever works right yeah you mentioned smashing pumpkins i love jimmy chamberlain's style because he, he is very heavy on the toms and it's it's very evident with his new uh his new solo he just put out a single on his solo oh, project that's... and it's it's very ambient and real spacious and experimental. And I, I really love his style. Oh, that sounds up my alley. Yeah, it's awesome. Hmm. And you mis mentioned the Afghan wigs. I just had Christopher Thorne from Blind Melon on last week and he's producing the new Afghan wigs album. So that's pretty Oh my exciting. gosh, what a small world. Yeah, that's awesome. Huh. So you're talking about like how you like to focus on those things and like what, what is your creative process like for the national and for anything really hmm. for the national the creative process begins usually with a like a sketch a, you know tiny patterns or rep like repetitive little chord progressions on a piano or a guitar and then i'll just kind of listen to that and try to chart out little patterns that might fit but you know, not be so standard. Um, and then it's just like a sculptural process where like lots of layering occurs and re-recording. I mean, it varies, you know, sometimes it just, we kind of do it in the traditional way. We're just like going to record it all live and track over that. But yeah, it's, it seems like it's, it's like a more methodical process, just like, and then from there, Matt has to kind of like zero in on what sketches work for him, you know, like we have a whole bunch of music that just has never been used, you know, it's just like instrumentals. You know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Do you guys focus a lot on like improv and just jamming to try to find new things to write with? I mean, we used to before all this business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. like, yeah, I think that's, that's 
kind of how we started, you know, just in the practice space, just doing whatever. And we're able to do that actually on stage after sound checks. And then the last few years of touring, we kind of, kind of, kind of uncorked the, <laughs> the bottle of just longer, freer kind of jams, if you will, um, with that. What's that? The last record, I Am Easy to Find, has a lot of opportunities to kind of like explore. Right. Um, the songs do live, I guess. Um, so I kind of lost track of the question. No, that makes sense. Like your creative process and things like that. Like, do you, do you enjoy the improv and like the really extending songs out to just kind of play and see what happens? I do. Yeah. I mean, but then again, I'm in the back, kind of like hidden behind a wall of, you know, metal th metal things. Um, so yeah, yeah, totally. I, uh, it's um, it's very freeing, and you know, we're not like the Grateful Dead. You right. know, it's it's still pretty. We're still playing like you know, within the framework of the tune. And but sometimes we'll, sometimes the drummers will get some free time. We added another drummer on the last two tours, James McAllister. So he and I will get to kind of like collectively solo right under, underneath like drones and stuff so you know, it's tasteful it's not like showmanship or anything it's more it's more like kind of grooves that we kind of develop and then ramp up and then ramp down in our classic sort of fashion of dynamically exploding songs um i guess the first time we did that was, was, was about today many years ago actually yeah we used to yeah, we used to improvise a lot with padma newsome when he was with the live act playing uh strings and keys um yeah i don't i don't <laughs> so you mentioned the grateful dead you guys did a a charity project back in in 16 um day of the dead so uh -huh. so you guys must be grateful dead fans like and it must influence your music a little bit yes and no i would i would say like Matt is not a fan. <laughs> okay. He's not not a fan. I think he, he appreciates more the culture of it and the whole like the history and like what they were able to do and all the advancements they made, you know, both musically and technologically. But as far as like listening to the dead, he's not really a dead fan. But that being said, he does like their their songs. But the question, right. it's not about Matt. It's about like, like, what about the dead? Like, yeah, like, do you find that it, it influences your play at all it influences my play for sure um in that i mean there's certain sonic things about the drumming in a, in particular eras of theirs like specifically you know like 79 to like 83 you know i really like the drum drum sounds then like late 70s you know um kind of before the big the mega dead uh, arena shows, right. you know, and it still sounded like kind of like a classic, classic, sorry, uh, drum set sound. But again, lots of toms and lots of notes. Um, but I think it's the attitude as well, you know, just kind of like, don't pressure yourself to repeat a specific thing. Just like, I think Garcia is on record for saying something along those lines, like how if he had to play the same thing exactly the same way twice, he would go bananas, you know. <laughs> That's so awesome. like, obviously there's like rhythms and parts I try to get, but later I've, I've, I realized like, it's just like, just stop thinking and just let your hands and your ears work and just enjoy the, the moment. Um, and avoid trying to like nail like specific figures or patterns or whatever. Right. Um, but I still like to be like precise. It's not like, like, just like, close your eyes and see what happens there's still like a thought process happening but yeah i think that's the main thing the dead can kind of bring to the, the world of playing is that you know you, you just stop being so uptight and just like play the room you know or just like whatever like find what works and go with that <laughs> right and just like Did you ever given. see them live i saw them a few t well i don't know how many probably like eight or ten times but towards the end 93 to 95 right um great shows though like super fun super fun um great songs i mean you know, it was but they you know, they were kind of at the end but uh yeah unforgettable 
That's awesome. Yeah. How did you transition? Like after trouble will find me, like did your process change much or anything? Like once you guys started to incorporate electronic drums and like drum pads and stuff like that? Uh -huh. Oh, I mean, my pro I'm still pretty like, um, what's the word? I'm not very advanced with my like electronic stuff. I'm more of like a, you know, turn it on, put it through an amp, see what happens, chop it up in Pro Tools kind of stuff. But um, like, I don't have like a collection of vintage drum machines. All you know, I've, I would like to, but, <laughs> right. but what I use is like kind of like new, new age or new stuff. But it's good. Um, but how did that change? Yeah, I think I mean the whole world kind of changed. <laughs> You know, um, and it's gotten way more advanced, like with the MIDI and like taking real sounds. You can make it, you can, some of the drumming I hear, it's like, oh, it's a real drummer. Like, nope, <laughs> MIDI. <I'm> like, wow. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, after Trouble, I think the band, we all kind of like, that's when we all moved out of New York City, essentially. I mean, Matt was already gone. And then I would soon leave. And then my brother moved out to the Long Island suburbs. And Aaron and Bryce moved upstate and then eventually to Europe. Um, yes, yeah, so I think yeah, a lot of it, a lot of electronics came in actually, yeah, through Aaron and Bryce with, with all their advances they made in their own, you know, musical endeavors. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. How did that affect the band when you guys all moved to different cities? Uh, I don't, I don't really know. I, I, I would say we, it, 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 it I mean, I guess we no longer had like the immediacy of being like able to, you know, walk down the street. But at the same time, we were all we're all like advancing in age and having kids grow older and spending more time doing the like, mundane life stuff. So I think it was actually good <laughs> for the for us as individuals to kind of get in and get out, as it were, you know. But um, yeah, I don't know. Now, yeah, now it's kind of like we meet up to work, you know, yeah. and we'll have like our social time is through like FaceTime or text messages, you know. Um, but yeah, I think leaving New York, I mean, New York built the band in a way. Without New York, we have never would have had a chance. But then I think leaving New York also kind of like has allowed the band to continue, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So... Just to add to that, Matt Bingley said, where do you guys go next? Like lots of songs from early in the band were about angst, but as you get more comfortable in life, when does digging that up kind of become too much? And like, what are uh, the plans? What are the plans sonically for the next album? Well, we always plan things and it never seems to actually occur the way we plan. But this time, the general... I mean, I don't want to put words in people's mouths, but what I, what I sense to be the general uh, approach would be to, you know, kind of like take a good long time off and then like reassemble at the studio at Aaron's place. And then just like, I mean, with some ideas ahead of time, sketches, demos coming in and just try to do it again, <laughs> as stripped down raw as possible, just like live drums, da da da. We'll still be electronics and stuff. But kind of like, I guess the back to basics record would be kind of what I think <laughs> would be a, an attempt that we could make. But again, like whatever happens, I mean, it's kind of like it, it takes over on its own. It, 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 once there's like a few good songs, then it just becomes like a the, the same mountain climbing expedition from before, you know, you just kind of, because we're still like a very much a song based band. But yeah, maybe we can do some improv too. Or that's the thing, we would just improv and then carve out you know, material from the improv. Right. But is there a new album on the horizon? I wouldn't say the horizon. <laughs> no. I mean, like in terms of like chronology, I couldn't say, but like, like I hope we can maybe get together like in the next 12, 24 months <laughs> to do something, you know, they're such big figures right now. Yeah, it's, everything's a question mark right now. So I think let's continue doing stuff remotely and just exchanging Dropbox links and that's it. <laughs> yeah. 
is uh, maybe it'll be that way. Maybe it'll be a whole remote record. I don't know. I, that that works. We'll take yeah. it. <laughs> is uh, farmers doing anything? Well, as I mentioned before, things I owe to people. Not really owe, but like a <laughs> Dave Nelson, one of the members. He's kind of the I don't know what you'd call it, the central cog who kind of like arranges stuff and then Danny takes it. I, I just kind of send Dave drum beats, you know, so I want to send him a bunch of beats. Um, and he's just a wizard with not just music, but the technology. So you can, can kind of like, it, well, the first record, Farmer's record, he actually was able to make, all the drumming was recorded on like uh, iPhone movies, like QuickTime movies. <laughs> It was just stuff I was filming in my practice space just for fun of myself. And I sent it to him. It was really cool, man. So just extracting it, took the audio and they made tracks out of it. Um, but this time I have more of a, it's behind me right now. I have more of a proper setup. Can um, we see it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's actually an empty room right now. <laughs> uh, I mean, my rig is modest. It's just like an Apollo 8P with a, one of those, what are they called? <laughs> those compressor EQ things, 1176. I don't even know. I'm, I'm so <laughs> like not even. Wait, there we go. Nice. Just that little bit. But I have some like decent mics, you know. I don't have any like vintage preamps or anything yet or channel strips, but you know, I'll get there. <laughs> it's, it's the input that matters. Yeah, well, I found this this tiny room that you can get nice, deep, low end, you know. Nice. Yeah, it's been too long since a farmer's track or record or anything. I, they're one of my favorites, favorite projects of yours. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. I love it, too. I love working with those guys. Yeah, that's fun. That's fun music. Um, has anyone ever told Danny that he sounds like Trent Reznor? <laughs> I never thought about that. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I, can, I can hear it in a lot of the older tracks. Mm-hmm. Maybe. Hmm. <laughs> um, I had a lot of questions about you being on the new Taylor Swift album. Okay. Um, but just most of them were like, did you have any idea at all while making the beats who you were making them for? Like, did you even have a guess? I know you're, there was a lot of NDAs and stuff going on at that time, but did okay. you... Did you suspect at all that it could have been for a Taylor Swift album? I did not, because I am not that bright. <laughs> <laughs> I should have, my spouse put it together right away. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't, I was like, nah, probably not her. Um, and then when I found out, I was like, oh, yeah, you told me that before. And you were right. <laughs> That's hilarious. I, I didn't, I don't know. I was just, I was just preoccupied with like, stuff and summer and like i'll i got i got a text message from aaron saying hey send me some send me a better version of that beat you did for this thing it's for this major label thing can't tell you who it is but i'll tell you soon I'm like cool <laughs> and that was it just one beat um that's such I a weird, the the song. weird scenario like what was were you given instructions on what the beat should have sounded like or did he already take a beat that you'd made and just told you to tighten it up kind of thing it was a pre-existing beat to me that I had written to a piece of music he sent me. Oh, okay. Right? It was just like a drum machine kind of Im improv, whatever. Um, do you ever work with the Spire recording system? <laughs> you know no. what that is? It's this like cute little, here it is. This is what I was using during the quarantine period. It's like a little two channel interface thing, but it works with like an app. Oh, nice. Um, but it's just like a lot easier for me than Pro Tools, you know, just. And it has so XLR easy. input? It's got XLR, it's got uh, two quarter inch, other combo ones, you know. Nice. Has its own internal mic. And then the app comes with all these like, uh, not silly, but kind of fun like effects to use, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, like really equalizers cool. and everything built right in? I mean, yeah. I mean, they're not like, you like higher end plug-in stuff, but they're just kind of fun. They have names like Monster Heat or like Sick. Deep Space. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, it, these cool effects. And then yeah, surprisingly, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty clean 
um, signal. Nice. I would set it um, to deep space and just leave it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so much love from Brazil. <laughs> this is another oh. question. How did you mentally prepare for a lot of sorrow? And so for anyone that isn't familiar is when you guys played your song sorrow for a little over six hours repeatedly. Right. So how did you guys <laughs> prepare for that crazy art exhibit? Well, if I may say so, first of all, much love back to Brazil. That is the site of some of our most like fun shows we've ever played. Like bonkers, awesome shows. Um, I prepared, I mean, I was living in, I was, we'd already left New York. So I was here in my basement, just like trying to do like the conditioning thing. Cause the song involves a very busy hi-hat pattern where it's just like straight 16ths, like dick it, dick it, dick it, dick it, dick it, dick it, the whole time, essentially, right? <laughs> so I was like, oh man, I gotta do a drum roll for a, a eight hour shift. I like, oh man. <laughs> so I hit the basement and I never really pushed it past I don't know. I think I, I think I did like maybe 45 minutes was my longest run. And then I just, uh, this went up there and did it. <laughs> I feel like in the moment with the adrenaline and like all the smoke and the lights, and there was, there was like, there was like a, a, a like a slapstick element to it as well. Cause the artist, uh, his name is Ragnar Schartensen. It was his, his concept. He would, appear randomly you know he's full he's full on like nice suit and hair slicked back and the big brushy mustache he would just come on stage with like a platter full of like hard to eat like messy food <laughs> <laughs> like i don't know, like soft shell crab sandwiches or something i don't it was just weird hors d'oeuvres you know right so we could take breaks though i, I did i did take breaks it wasn't like non-stop i went to the bathroom a couple times um, but the whole thing was that it kept going. You know, there was there was always some audio happening. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of, and, like, and like anything that happens, it, it, it just goes by faster than it felt like. <laughs> and it didn't feel like six and a half hours or whatever it was. It felt like one or two. <laughs> right. Did it? Yeah. Did the song change by the end in any way? E I mean, now in hindsight, we should have changed it more. But it, it, we kept the same form and the chords it's more like the feeling is different obviously the tempo is going to change but it's all it was all within, the, within that range the tempo um i think there were times where matt kind of got really into it and became super emotional and there was a crowd there too and a lot of them were so from what i could tell several stayed the entire time as well <laughs> so it's kind of it's kind of like i guess it's i've never ran a marathon but it's kind of like that i imagine you know yeah. Like the crowd kind of like helped you. And so it was, it, there were some emotional moments. It was really nice. Did it teach you anything? Did you learn anything about yourself or about just live <laughs> music in general? Uh, I mean, I, it taught me I could, you know, play drums all day. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I mean, it was like an art event. It was just fun to be included in that world, you know, for a, for a moment. Um, yeah. I don't know. That's such a crazy concept and experience. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite song to play live? Oh gosh, the national songs. Sure. It depends. I don't know. I really like to play uh, the easy ones. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't do anything. Little breaks. Vanderlaan. I love Vanderlaan. <laughs> Just playing like tambourine. Uh, I don't know. I really like to play. I like to play Blood Buzz. That can be fun. Yeah, that um, all the way back. That's like my favorite album, way back. Oh, there. High Violet. Yeah, that's a great one. I like that record too. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, pretty much. I guess it's more like the ones I don't like to play. The ones that are hard and I can look at music or kind of are a bit stressful. But yeah, I don't know. I've been, I, I had a crisis of confidence a few years ago where I was having trouble playing uh, quick kick drum hits or just getting comfortable. It was a total mental block. And since I've gotten over that, I like playing everything, you know? <laughs> yeah. One person said, why is it Squalor Victoria? <laughs> <laughs> the title is Matt's thing. 
I have no idea. I don't know where he, it's something he, he hears things. It could be a snippet of a conversation or a reference to something. I have no idea. Sorry. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> That's a good one to play on drums too. We haven't played it for a while, but yeah, that was, it was, yeah. Cause it has the, again, those toms are nice and right. big sounding through a, a nice system. And it's also easy. <laughs> right. Exactly. So that's one of your favorites. Well, <laughs> no, I don't know. Sure. Just for the purposes of this interview, one of my favorites. <laughs> Write it down. <laughs> um, one person asked, how do you get that nice snare sound? What's your secret? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, there's really no secret. It's, I, I wish I could, I mean, live or on tape? I don't know. Both. Because live, I, I wish I knew the microphones. I don't. But they're pretty common, sure, microphones. Um, but basically, the drum I use live, I use like a nothing special. It's one of those Ludwig maple snares that's like, I think it's like eight inches deep. It's either 14 by eight or 14 by six. So I think it's eight. So I think the depth gives it, you know, that body. But then there's a fair bit of uh, muting or muffling that goes into it that my drum tech and I over the years have developed. It's, it's not like fancy, it's, it's, you know, it's just like some moon gels, one of those like, those re-ring things, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <laughs> well, those goes on top. A lot of times I'll put like different types of cloth of varying thicknesses. Usually I'll stick with very thin, like a, like a, what's that stuff called? Silk. Right. Like a thin silk cloth, uh, any number of things. Nice. But, uh, and then it's, I have it fairly loose, you know. So there are uh, secrets. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much obvious. No, 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 I'm not trying to, you know, it, it, there's nothing like, there's no special drum or product. It's all just stuff you get at, you know, musician's friend or Sweetwater or whatever you, wherever you buy your gear from. Right. Um, but then in the studio, it's a whole different game. I mean, we're switching snares out, but it's usually the same thing. There's lots of tape or moon gels or rings or cloth. Um, and I tend to favor just like deeper wood drums. And, you know, I, I don't, no, like, you know, drummers, when we get really deep, we'll talk about, like, how many plies and what those plies consist of, <laughs> you know. I don't know. It's probably like a maple mahog mahogany is a good one. Maple poplar is a common mix. I don't know. And, and then, of course, the bearing edge of the drum is going to pretty much define the sound, you know. Right. I mean, so I don't know. Quite a bit to it if you don't know what you're doing. Sorry? There's quite a bit to it if you're not a drummer. Like, I, you lost me halfway through. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's all <laughs> just shorthand drum nerd stuff. It's, I mean, I don't know. So you had one fan that asked, is he planning on buying a house in Portugal? And if he wants, to, ask him if he wants to have dinner at my place. <laughs> That's so funny because that is one of the long-term goals of dreams, you know would be to, you know, reside abroad, and especially in Portugal, you know, where we love going. Why Portugal? So. Just had so many great experiences there, and it's just, it's just a fantastic place to go. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I've never been, but it's definitely on that list if travel ever happens again. Yeah, I right know, right? Um, and... Last of the random questions, someone wanted to know what your favorite TV series and or books are at the moment. <laughs> well, I don't really watch much TV, but I did recently watch a series like during the early months of the quarantine called The Last Kingdom right. on Netflix. It's about like the Danes invading England and like, it's like the time of King Alfred. So it's like the 800s. Um, there's lots of slaying goes on and you know uh, it's just like a real I don't know kind of easy to watch kind of shaggy dog story involving like guys with long hair and tattoos like attacking it's, it's just fun it's a, it's a fun rewarding watch 
Nice. Um, uh, I used to work in book publishing. I've, I've kind of dumbed down. And I, the last few books I've read, I, I read a book called, um, I forget the author's name. It's a British novel called Autumn, <laughs> which was excellent. And then the writer, David Mitchell, I tried to read everything by him. He has a new book out, which I haven't read. It's called Utopia Avenue, but he has several others. I read a few. What's the uh, the Bone Clocks, I think, was one recently. And uh, the one I really liked was, I think it was called The, the Two Autumns of Jacob de Zoet or something, set in, like, Meiji, Japan. Really fascinating. Magical realism, kind of. Anything by Murakami. Uh what else? Usually novels. I'm more of like a literary fiction guy, you know? You say you used to work in publishing? I used to work in publishing in the early days of the National from uh, like 97 to 05. Nice. Is yeah. that something you would ever want to get back into? Uh, <laughs> at this point, it's impossible. I'm too far out of the game. I remember when I left in 05, my boss was like, well, you know, like, you know, the publisher was like, you know, um, you can always come back, but after you know, after a year or two, it's going to be hard to get back in the business. I'm like, yeah, I get it, you know, totally. Um, but yeah, I would love to, I love copy editing and proofreading, you know, anything with that, you know, red colored pencil, blue pencil, whatever you want, post-its and pencils. I love getting lost in like manuscript pages and, you know, making corrections. Right. <laughs> Finding errors. <laughs> <laughs> nice. No, I just, so all the new music you got out and you said there's some more uh, Lanzendorf on its way, maybe possibly an LP. What else? Definitely an LP. Definitely? Yeah. Lanzendorf 2, I think we're calling it. Nice. <laughs> so other than the things that are already mentioned and that are upcoming, is there any other new music we can expect from you? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, I do, I do intend to, hit the stay down here in the winter and like i see you have all these awesome guitars i i want to get back in the guitar game and like try to make royal green too nice or at least have enough songs so i can play like some brunch sets in the spring like do some sort of like brunch core performance i don't know um but yeah okay <laughs> school just started so i gotta I got get back to it i've kind of had some, some time off you know <laughs> nice Right on. Well, man, thank you so much for doing this. I look forward to hearing all that new music. I love the new Lanzendorf. I love the the style and just the experimental aspect feel that I get from it. And I, oh, wow. I can't wait to hear more and hopefully some more farmers too. That's like I said, that's my, that's my shit. So. Oh man. Thank you so much, man. T totally appreciate it. Thanks for doing Good this. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. And thank you for having me. Thanks, man.